So I do study fossils quite a bit, but I use tools to look at fossils that are pretty medically relevant. And so a lot of the work that I do with medical students uses these tools for radiology and three-dimensional imaging processes that we call volumetrics. And so a lot of the research that I'm going to share with you guys today is uh, focused on these directly relevant medical student research projects. And so as you can see, here is a beautiful three-dimensional rotating brain with all of the white matter fibers imaged in OK State, America's brightest orange. And so I want to start out by telling you guys a little bit about me because I'm sure you're really used to who I am in the classroom by now, especially those of you who are second year medical students who have seen me almost every day for the last week or so. But I also have a pretty vibrant research program, and a large part of my research program is being a scientific advisor at a micro CT imaging facility along with Dr. G. We operate a pretty fancy micro CT scanner out of the University of Arkansas in a partnership with OK State, UARC, and funded by the National Science Foundation. And so what our team did is we brought this really powerful tool to this region that is called the U.S. Interior Highlands. So if you've ever wondered what kind of like green country as it extends into Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, southeastern Kansas, uh, and Missouri, the name for that region is actually the U.S. Interior Highlands. And so we brought this tool in because we can use it to really peek inside any object, whether it's an engineered sample or whether it's a skull or an anatomical specimen. We can use x-rays to non-destructively image pretty much anything at a rate of about 100 or 1 to 100 microns. So these are tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of a millimeter. And this regional facility is at the University of Arkansas, but we use it to facilitate research all over the Midwest. And we use it to support all areas of science and technology. So if there's a project that you are curious about that involves biological engineering, that involves looking at or imaging things like stents or looking at and quantifying anatomy, this is what this facility does. So we participate in life science, earth history, agricultural research, culture, behavior, cognition, medicine, and engineering. And so we capture things like high resolution 3D visualizations of anatomy that enhance functional research in biological, biomedical, paleontological, agricultural, and geological sciences. I'm not kidding when I say that if you name it, we can scan it, we can image it, and we can collect data about it and form a really nice project. And we can do that with exceptionally high detail. And so a lot of what we've started looking at, in addition to fossils and biological specimens, are also things like these images of stents and 3D printed rapid prototyping. All of this data has to be processed and I process it since it's mainly CAT scans because it's a CT scanner in the Translational Anatomical Biomedical Image Processing Lab. And if you're wondering, that acronym is TABI because we look at CAT scans. So in TABI, we develop biological imaging tools that improve on some of today's gold standards. So here you're seeing an MRI of a human brain and you can compare the detail in this high resolution MRI to a brain that we recently scanned at about 90 microns. That's several hundred times more resolution than you would get coming out of a medical scanner. So here's another way of looking at that. We can get almost cellular level detail with the images that we can capture at micro and then reconstruct in the TABI lab, whether this is a biomedical model like the Norwegian rat or a human MRI. And when it comes down to it, uh, MRI can be really difficult to work with in a research environment. I mean, obviously there are advantages in that your patients are typically alive, but for processing 
pathological data or using cadavers from our lab who have generously donated their body through our World Body Program, we can capture images in a very different context. And so X-ray CT scanning can resolve a lot of these problems of expense and speed and resolution, but it doesn't resolve tissues. So here is an alligator from Dr. Genak's research, and you can see the bones very well, and you can see the outside of the animal very well, but CT scans don't pick up a lot of information about soft tissue. And when we want to look Yes. And so in the Tabby Lab, we have two key ways of collecting data. I use a lot of radiopaque latex vascular injections so that I can map entire arterial trees and have them in that entire anatomical content context. We also use a method that Dr. G developed that's called DICE-CT, which stands for Diffusible Iodine-Based Contrast Enhanced Computed Tomography. And DICE-CT allows us to get MRI types of images where white matter can be this very vivid white and gray matter can be a very well-defined gray, but we can get that at much higher resolution comparatively so that we can do things like image individual branches of the arbor vitae of the cerebellum and really follow a lot of the tracks that if you're here and you're a second year student, you're working really hard to understand better right now. And so we apply these to a lot of different scenarios in our research. With our graduate students, we tend to look at function, like biomechanics. We also look at development and evolution of pretty much any anatomical structure. And because these methods allow us to do this rapidly, we can expand these questions to be quite comprehensible, co comprehensible, wow, comprehensive. Um, and another advantage is that these methods are often reversible. And so we have a lot of research opportunities. If you're interested in cardiovascular research, we can make digital models of the heart or digital models of the vascular tree and use hemodynamics simulators to artificially flow blood through those structures to better understand their physiology. We can look at aneurysms and what contributes to them. We can look at heat transfer and thermal exchange. So there's a lot of potential for developing novel animal models for arteriovenous malformations. We can look at a lot of structure and function relationships. And so if you are interested in coming to my lab, I don't do a lot of field work anymore. So primarily you would be working at one of these very high-tech trash cans, um, which is a Mac Pro. They are super beefy computers. We have computers that range everywhere from 64 gigabytes of RAM, but your average laptop is about eight gigabytes. And then we also have a super beefy computer that was customized by one of our recent graduates, Skylar Turner, so that it operates at uh, over 250 gigabytes of RAM. So it has some pretty significant computing power for putting together these large scale engineering simulations. And so now I kind of want to transition to highlighting some of the uh, medical student imaging research projects that have taken place in my lab since COVID began, because one of the advantages of this research is that you don't need to come into my lab to accomplish it. You can actually do this from home. You can work from anywhere as long as you have a computer that can remote into the lab. And so the first project that we tackled was reproducibility and some common imaging techniques, and then the continued development of an app that we're calling NeuroRelay. So let's start by looking at imaging reproducibility. So in neuroscience, you can learn a lot about a patient by getting CT scans or getting MRI scans of their brains periodically throughout the course of, for example, a progressive illness. And we can take data from that brain to monitor the progression of that disease using 3D volumetry. So 3D brain regions can be digitally mapped either by hand or by computer algorithm. 
And in medicine, it's very common to see these types of images made by computer algorithms, but we still say that the gold standard is mapping them by hand because we have this idea that hand segmentation or hand modeling of three-dimensional structures is going to be more diligent and have the decision-making power of your human brain behind it. And so this is an example of a study that looked at the replicability of automated segmentation in these kind of orangey red blobs and manual segmentation in the green blobs. So what we wanted to know is to kind of flip that script and ask, are there ways to improve manual segmentation? And so our advanced neuroimaging team set out to find out. And this was right at the start of the pandemic. And so this great group of six medical students helped me with a reproducibility project where we looked at this digital imaging tool called resampling. So resampling is a software tool that increases the resolution of photographs. And so here's an example of this with a shoe. You can see our original image, it's tiny. When it gets resized to be larger, those pixels get more noticeable. And so resampling is a method that averages along the edges of where like a white piece of the shoe is meeting a gray piece of the shoe. So it doesn't introduce new information. It can only average the grayscale values that are already here from the whitest whites to the darkest blacks. And so what we thought it might do is provide a little bit more working room. If you tried to build a model of this shoe out of Legos, it might vaguely look like a shoe, but it wouldn't really look like a shoe. It would look pretty awkward. So if you try to build this out of big Legos, you may get the essence of a shoe, but not really. So if you try to build this with tinier Legos and get a little bit more resolution, you may be able to have a more accurate representation of that surface. And so we also thought that maybe it allows contours of brain regions to be followed more easily. On the flip side, you're adding more voxels and adding more voxels, artificially increasing that resolution could add more room for human error. But nobody has done a survey of this. Nobody has actually formally studied it in a three-dimensional context. And so we chose to study this in a formal context by looking at the putamen. This is because the putamen is correlated with a broad array of pathologies, including neurodegenerative processes. And so the putamen itself is very important clinically, but it's also relatively easy to segment. It's kind of like a little, almost a walnut shaped structure. So it's got a very simple outline and it's relatively easy to identify and trace. And so we had this setup of dueling protocols where we had this nice, relatively high resolution MRI of a healthy medical student and one team made a digital model of that putamen at the original resolution, which is about one millimeter slices. And the second team increased that resolution artificially through a version of resampling called upsampling to about 0.3 by 0.3 millimeters instead of one millimeter. So that's quite a bit higher resolution. And so we split these up where each individual in both of these teams made five sequential models of the putamen. And then we tested whether there was a difference in the mean surface area, the mean volume, as well as the degree of variance. So means can actually be pretty close to the same, but one study might have whiskers on that mean that are really broad and another might have whiskers that are really narrow and that's an important statistical difference as well so we looked at a t-test for the mean and a levine's test for the homogeneity of that variance 
And so here's what the medical students illustrated. You can see all five models for all six of our students. And in the top in orange, we have our original resolution. And you can see that it is chunkier. The bricks are a lot bigger, but there's quite a bit of consistency among each of our segmenters and across all of the models. If you compare that to our resampled team, the surfaces do look maybe a little bit less chunky, but they're also a lot more variable. And so they may be about the same size, but there's more room to interpret what that structure looks like. And this team certainly did. And so our result is that with manual segmentation, resampling can add a lot of variation in surface area. So here is our resampled surface area compared to our original resolution surface area. And that's because it's kind of like taking a piece of corrugated cardboard. A flat surface on that cardboard is going to be low surface area, but as soon as you get those little ridges in there, it really increases the surface area of that cardboard or the villi of your intestines. So adding more slices, adding more voxels of resolution increased the opportunity for there to just be slight variations in how the segmentation was lining up. We actually saw the opposite when it came to volume. And so for volume, our original resolution had quite a bit more variation and our variance was much lower in our resampled version. So the, for volume, resampling was giving us a significantly reduced uh, variation, a much more consistent result. And so we were able to make the recommendation that if your interested in tracing what happens with surface area of a neurological structure, you should use the original resolution file. But if you want to more consistently reconstruct volume, like let's say you have a 50 patient study, you're probably going to want to increase that resolution through resampling before you have a team of multiple people make all of those 3D models. Then I want to wrap up by sharing with you guys NeuroRelay, because NeuroRelay is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. So a lot of you guys are affiliated with our medical program. You're going to be future physicians. And as it turns out, we have a pretty massive neurology work short, workforce shortage in the United States. And Oklahoma is no exception to this rule. In the state of Oklahoma, demand for neurologists is more than 20% of our supply. So that leads up to a lot of people waiting to see a clinician as well as clinician overwork. And so we desperately need neurologists. And to just underscore how much we need neurologists in the state and across the country, here are the 10 leading causes of preventable deaths in the United States. And of these, six are either directly related to the central nervous system or have tie-ins to the central nervous system. And so cancer, including brain cancers, unintentional injuries are often traumatic brain injuries. Stroke is directly a disease of the central nervous system, as well as Alzheimer's. Diabetes has significant impact on the central nervous system. And suicide is also related to central nervous system processes. And so as our second years are currently learning, a lot of these points of damage we call lesions in the central nervous system. And so six of our 10 leading causes of death include or are directly central nervous system lesions. And one of those barriers to neurology is actually perception-based. So there's an extreme aversion that is deeply cultural, both inside and outside of medicine. You've probably heard phrases like, oh, it's not like it's brain surgery or anything. And so that sets us up to have this expectation that of many of the areas that our students could specialize in, neurology is exceptionally more difficult than the others. And here's an example of that. So one of the highest barriers to 
neurology is this phenomenon called neurophobia, which comes from a perception of complexity before students even begin to take their classes. And so 47% of allied health students report that their biggest challenge in tackling neuro content was actually their perceived complexity of this topic even more so than their difficulty understanding or difficulty visualizing, just this idea that it is so complex as to be unobtainable. And there are roadblocks that also include available resources. I'm sure for those of you who are second year students on this call right now, you've seen that our resources are either too much information in a way that is way too abstract or not enough information in a way that is maybe too vivid. And so all of these resources, there's either too much information, not enough information. Those two scenarios lead up to this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that neuro is too hard because the resources aren't what students need. And so our goal is to use these techniques in my lab to kind of bridge that gap to make neuro fun, clear, and accessible. And we're trying to make a good use of technology to implement this visualization of a dynamic process for dynamic learning. And so that's what our students and I and Dr. G have started putting together as we build and make illustrations of what we hope Neuro Relay will look like. And so we hope that this becomes a comprehensive neurology atlas and lesion solving relay race. And so we used the DICE CT technique that Dr. G developed in the Tabby lab to obtain extremely high resolution images of the human brain from our body donors. So the way this works is that brains are submerged in what's called Lugol's iodine for about six weeks. It's a very hands-off process. And then once the brains are fully stained, we scan them at that micro facility that we manage in Fayetteville. And so when we do this, we can achieve resolutions that are half the diameter of a human hair. And so the results are contrasted because iodine is a pretty heavy molecule. And then medical students come in and build these models. We have about 2000 sequential images from our micro CT scans for each brain. And students come in and trace in 3D the structures in our software called Aviso. And I believe is Paula on, oops. Uh, is yeah, Paula still on here? Hey, Paula. So Paula did this for the extraocular muscles of the orbit over the summer so that we can add the orbit to neuro relay. Um, and she did a pretty bang up job. We're going to use those models in neuro this fall. And so it's a matter of kind of paint by numbering in some of these. Uh, yeah, go Paula. Paula did a great job. Her models were beautiful. Um, so it's a lot of paint by numbers. You go through and you bring in the structures, paint them in using a magic wand. And the result is this three-dimensional neuroanatomy within its original context. If you know Liz Johnson, this is a pair of hippocampi that she dissected for our original set of neural relay models. This is an enlarged pineal gland that was imaged by Haley Riley that we will also be looking at in our neuro class this fall as one of our common pathologies. We've been able to host Neuro Relay on the web using Sketchfab so far. This is also student managed and we applied for the OK State app competition in 2020 and we actually won. And so now we are working on this process of developing this mock-up into a real app where you can find an atlas that will show you in animated detail the sequence and the order of these central nervous system pathways and processes in a very isolated targeted model that's not a whole bunch of ridiculous information um, and that also has this dynamic 
visualization of how these processes are occurring. And we hope that once we develop Neuro Relay to its completion, that anyone in pretty much any allied health field could use this to learn and ameliorate some of that uh, neurophobia that is a pretty common barrier into entry of neurology as a field. So that is what I have for you guys. It is exactly three o'clock. So how is that for timing? That's Does wonderful. That um, I was gonna say, um, I appreciate that. I learned a lot about all the stuff you do and let's open it up for questions from students or other guests. Where are you hoping to release your app? That's a great question. So we are designing it for Android and iOS. So the hope is that it can be compatible with tablets and smartphones everywhere. Is there a time, time frame on that? Probably a couple of years because we have several more pathways and regions of the central nervous system to segment. So these things don't take a massive amount of time, but Paula, how much time did it take you to make a bunch of the orbital uh, muscles, vasculature, and nerves over the summer? Um, a lot more time than I thought. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it takes a while to develop these. We have every model that we need for our neuro lab, but we're working on also doing every neuro relay. We're working on doing a lot of additional details. So um, we have applied for a grant to fund a team of medical students each summer for the next two years with Dr. Vassar that hopefully will allow us to complete those models. And then in the background, while that's happening, work with a team of developers to do all of the background programming. Are you hoping you'll use the app? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We are very much hoping that we can use the app and the nervous system course in the future. So a lot of you guys in lab this week were looking at the Sketchfab models while also handling brain in lab and using that to kind of help contextualize or identify the structures that you were looking for on your real brains. And so I thought that that worked out really well this past week, and I hope that we continue doing that. Yeah, you are so welcome. All right, well, thank you guys for your time and your attention. I hope you enjoyed learning about my lab and what happens in it. And um, even if folks watch this later via recording, please don't hesitate to reach out to me about future opportunities. Hopefully we hear back on that grant soon. I think we should hear back by the end of this week. And so I'm really hoping that we might have some paid research opportunities to come in and build some of these 3D models and look at the anatomy in a clinical context. All right, well, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. you all have a great It was afternoon. a great presentation. Um, and thank you for coming and sharing with us. We'll post this presentation online so that it can be made available to um, medical students and as I get um, requests um, about research opportunities, I'll be sure and direct them to this video so they can get an overview before they come and, and reach out to you. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I'm gonna get back to my neuro office hours and hopefully continue lowering some blood pressure while I'm out here. So, all right, thank you guys.